My name is Gwyn Dyer. I'm a journalist and I'm in Edmonton at the moment. Ah, perfect. How did you find yourself uh, doing international freelance journalism? Well, it certainly wasn't what I grew up dying to do. I didn't even know you could do it. Um, <laughs> actually, I, um, and like most people who know something about a subject and then see them, them writing about it in the papers, I got really fed up because I knew a lot about the Middle East and there was a coup in Turkey and I was furious because they were getting these details wrong in the newspaper, in the Times, in London, they, you know, right in the front page, errors. And I'm wandering around, the, around the, the apartment, you know, waving this in the air and going on about how stupid they are. And my wife, to shut me up, says, well, why don't you write something? And I said, well, can I do that? Meaning, am I allowed, I think? I mean, you know, it had never occurred to me that I could be a journalist. She said, of course you can. So I sat down and I, you know, if she had the sense to count up how many words were on the page, how many words were in that article, and I wrote an article of similar length in which I pointed out certain things they seemed to have missed. And I got in the car and I drove down to Fleet Street, where the Times still had their offices in those days, and they printed it. And I was a journalist. It was just like that. So I thought, hey, this is fun, said my mother a clipping. Um, they gave me 30 pounds, I think which even in those days wasn't a lot of money. Um, and, but, you know, you get the bug, and I wrote more for more newspapers, and eventually I got this idea, well, hey, I don't have to stick with England, which is where I was living at the time, I can do this all over the place. And I went and looked up some newspapers' addresses, and I sent it to the Toronto Star, and the Canberra Times, and the New Zealand Herald, and what have you, and they sent money back. So I was in business. I gave up the day job, and I was a journalist specifically in your life at the time, did you have to make any major sacrifices to do this? Not a one. All I had to do was give up going to work. Your climate wars this morning, you said that the press softens up the idea of uh, global warming and the effects for the general public. Do you think that people would just freak out if they knew this was happening? Or would, if this went more mainstream, would they come together and make a bigger difference? I think that the... Um, by and large, the media don't know how serious the situation is because while there is not a conspiracy of silence, a great many people, particularly official people, are reluctant to talk about the scale and, and speed of the, the, with which this problem is coming to us, towards us. Um, politicians don't want to say it because if they did, then they'd have to spend the money to fix it and that's just not available and they'd pay a big political price if they advocated spending that kind of money to deal with a problem that is only going to affect maybe people's children, you know, and we don't actually invest in our children, it's not, we like to say we do, but we don't. Um, we're selfish for us now. So politicians are reluctant to ask us what they think we won't do, and the journalists don't know the right questions to ask most of them, it's a technical subject, and they regard it as an interesting controversy, and you can stand up a scientist who says, yes, there is a problem. Like you can, if you look hard enough, you can find some scientist who will say, no, there's not a problem, and you put them on head to head, they butt heads, it's good television. Okay, I've done my work with climate change for this month, I don't have to study up in this, know anything about it myself, I got a good argument out of it, it's good television. Well, there's a bit more to it than that, but uh, you know, you mustn't expect the media to do your work for you, frankly, uh, nor the politicians. I mean, they're uh, um, they're lazy. Have you made any personal living changes uh, based on the results of your interviews or the experiences you've learned while researching this? You know, the answer to that is no, because I began to understand what I hadn't, which is that you don't fix this by becoming a vegetarian and riding a bicycle. It's bigger than that. What we have to do is stop burning fossil fuels. We've got to remain a high energy society, so we've got to find a whole bunch of other sources of energy that will not put the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. But just slowing down the process by easing back on the accelerator a bit isn't going to make the slightest bit of difference. We'll just arrive at the point of no return two years later. No. This has got to be addressed at source. You don't fix it. I mean, they, you, you know, cutting consumption helps, sure. You know, yeah, okay, I have made, I mean, I sort of spent an enormous amount of money in, in insulating my house, and it wasn't to save on electricity bills. It was, you know, and I drive about 2,000 miles a year, and I haven't replaced the car in 14 years, because even though it's not very fuel efficient, it would cost more in carbon terms to buy a new one, because they have to build it. Um, 
So I do things like that. On the other hand, I fly a lot because that's my job. Um, but you don't solve it by changing your lifestyle. You solve it by changing the way you generate energy. If you don't do that, all the lifestyle style changes that you make will simply mean that the disaster comes three, four, ten years later. Human revolution That's all. possible in these situations? Can we get global peace when people have too many different ideas? I once made a film about war, a whole film movie, a television series about war. And when you came to the last episode, it was interesting because all of the ideologies came out of the covers people usually keep them hidden in the people who are working on the series. And I think that the, the largest number of people wanted me to make some sort of impassioned plea for a change in the human heart that would end war. And I thought, no, that's nonsense. The human heart's not going to change, but the human heart isn't the problem. I don't you know, attack my neighbors, beat my children. This is something that states do. We don't, most of us, do it individually. This is not about how we respond as individuals. This is about how the structures that we have built respond. So that's what you have to address, is the structures, the international structures, the national structures, the ideologies, the nationalism, all that stuff has to be addressed at source because that's the only way you're going to be able to deal with this problem. Rather as, you know, the same argument, you know, how do you deal with the climate change problem? Not lifestyle changes, or at least not primarily lifestyle changes, what you've got to do is stop burning fossil fuels. And since you can't stop using energy, you've got to replace it with something else. And, and, you know, things are there. So, you know, in all of these cases, the idea that, I wish I, I guess it's not a happy thing to say, that you cannot by your individual actions change the world, and the fact is you can't. By your political actions, combined with many other people, you can change the world. But individually, no, you can't. Dropping the bucket, is, I'm afraid, is what we're talking about. And even if we all put drops in the bucket, I'm going to mix my metaphors here, the bucket would eventually overflow. I mean, it, you know, if you go on burning fossil fuels, you create a disaster. If you use fewer fossil fuel, less fossil fuel, if you cut back on your energy use, the disaster will come a bit later. But it is a bucket. It fills up. And when it's full, it's going to overflow. And you have a disaster on your hands. And it isn't that distant even now. Um, just cutting our consumption without attracting the problem at source won't solve that. Just dealing with our own attitudes and, and, and responses will not solve the problem of war. You have to address the structures. And we began. I mean, we, we figured that out 60 years ago. We created the United Nations precisely to deal with that problem. Not that it dealt with it very well, but after all, you know, first tries never really It worked. seems like it's, it's not coming down to the individual. It's more based on the governments and how, how the countries deal with these things. A again, you said the individual isn't making making a conscious decision here so do you think that maybe in the future if, if, if the human revolution for global peace is possible that there would just be a single government or something like the UN? Well there is something like the UN but it is not a global government and I don't think there's going to be one in the foreseeable future and frankly I'm not sure I'd like to see one. I mean hey we've got three levels of government already right? Municipal, provincial and federal. You really want a fourth I mean, you know, I don't want a war, I don't want trade wars, I don't I want people to cooperate at the international level, but the cooperation that's necessary at the international level is pretty institutionalized anyway, right? Everybody recognizes each other's passports, we have protocols for doing trade, it, the banks, God bless their little brown socks, do what they have to do, and everybody operates more or less by the same ridiculous rules. But all of this stuff is, is beyond the reach of individuals, except when we act politically. Collectively, politically, we can make the decisions. But in terms of lifestyle changes or, you know, that sort of thing, it's not going to do the trick. It's not enough. It isn't that it's unimportant, but it's not enough.